Dr. Klatt is a pathologist. E em 1991, ele é, foi professor na Universidade de Utah, onde foi professor de patologia e diretor do curso de patologia para estudantes de medicina. Ele foi pioneiro na produção de material institucional digital, incluindo o website e cd -ROMs. Em 2001, projetou e desenvolveu o currículo, currículo para Florida State University School of Medicine e serviu no Conselho Nacional de Examinadores Médicos dos Estados, dos Estados Unidos. Em seguida, mudou-se e transferiu-se para o campus da Savannah Mercy University School of Medicine em 2008, onde atuou e atuou como diretor do Programa para Educação e Ciência Básica e continua desenvolvendo interessantes projetos de materiais educacionais através da multimídia. O professor Klatt é autor de quatro de sete trabalhos publicados na série Hopkins and Cotton de Livro de Patologia. Recebeu mais de 15 prêmios e distinções por excelência em ensino, incluindo de excelência em ensino de ciências básicas Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society em 1996. Dr. Klatt, tudo isso está perfeitamente caso e vai nos apresentar a conferência intitulada Information Technologies, the Next Generation in Pathology Education. All of those issues are very important for us in Brazil, and all of us are anxious to hear you. Dr. Klatt, please, you can start your speech. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear well. Um, I've got my PowerPoint projected. I sent that along, so it could be downloaded as well. Um, this talk is going to focus primarily on learning theory in relation to instructional technologies. If we can understand how people learn or not, then perhaps we can design appropriate educational strategies. So we will be looking at cognitive theories and how those affect learning. And in that regard, once we know how people learn, how can we develop electronic tools for learning, or how do they affect learning, and then what is the role of pathology in that process. So to begin with, I always like to remind everybody that we use a variety of learning styles. In pathology, we are predominantly visual learners, but we listen, we read and write, and we do things. And I should point out that when we are learning, we generally use more than one at a time. Most learners are very good at multimodal learning. However, I will point out that we should not be multitasking when we are learning. Using more than one mode at a time, in fact, increases learning capacity over just a single mode, which is why just reading the book does not work that well. This particular graphic is over 60 years old now, and it highlights what is active and what is passive. When we are just reading, then we're at the top of the pyramid and we're not gaining that much. Um, this graphic is telling us how much gain and knowledge we have over time, and this would be long-term gain, uh, based on the activity. You could argue that in a lecture format such as now, that perhaps we might get up to 50% because we will see it here. And I see Dr. Geis' smiling face in the front row there, and he's a good example of somebody who is at the top of that because he's taking his notes as he's listening and seeing. Um, but if you stand in the back of the lecture hall and you see what is going on in your class, you note that you are probably down around 10 to 20 percent. If you take students and put them in a small group, where they are much more interactive, then you are probably at least at the 50% level and hopefully at the 70% level. And then when we send the students out to work in real healthcare settings, in 
residencies and clerkships than they are doing, and at that point, you get up around 90% retention. I will point out, however, that by doing a simulation of the real thing, and that can include a case in a small group, you begin to approach 90%. So active learning is not only the content, which is what most students want to focus on, but also the process, and the process has to include active learning with active synthesis, and just sitting on your seat listening isn't going to do very well. If we as instructors understand that, then we try to organize our information and our delivery so that we encourage active modes of learning. Learners, however, have to use that information and increase their own understanding using the concepts. Every place I go, I hear the same story about how learners are less and less engaged in traditional learning modes. And I see my colleagues and people around me also suffering the same problems. And it has to do with this attention span. As life goes on, we get more information to deal with, and we have many more distractions. I like to say we live in an information-toxic world and trying to filter that information is very challenging. But if we can only get people to keep attention up, but learning theory tells us that adult attention span begins to decay after only 20 minutes. I tell my students, get it hard for 20 minutes, take a quick break, start over again. If you're trying to do multiple tasks at the same time, you're simply diluting that process. Um, I give attention span as a, an exponential of curiosity because if you've ever noticed just how curious a child can get at something and how they ignore everything else going around them, that's a good example of really being attentive. So that's the problem. If we look at the way short-term learning works, um, you realize just how difficult the process it is. If you're using just short-term active memory, you can keep very few pieces of new information in working active memory at one time. Generally, only two to four of these can be processed at the same time, and only for a few seconds. And generally, after 20 seconds, you begin to lose it unless you review it. So how many learn-forget cycles are there? I don't know. If we assume it's just one after having read the book through once, or listened once to the lecture, we are kidding ourselves because it takes a lot of review. Modern textbooks and medical textbooks in particular are very good at densely packing information. We have sentences that average over 20 words, and there might be five new words in those sentences, and a novice learner using active memory might not even make it to the end of one sentence before forgetting what was at the beginning of the sentence and have to start all over again. We as experts are using long-term working memory, and our information is not limited to just a few items. We can pull out many bits of information from long-term memory almost instantaneously. Not only that, but we have organized that information into schemes and algorithms and methods of using the information that help us to instantly recognize the situation, instantly utilize that stored knowledge. So we have organized patterns that we can recall and apply very quickly. Novice learners for the first time cannot do that. I will point out that if you have to take a test with a very extensive set of objectives and it's a very difficult test, then you will read at a very slow rate. Anybody trying to pass any examination on any subject will read at a very slow rate. Those of us who are familiar with the subject tend to do what's called skimming and scanning, and we are going at 400 to 600 words per minute. So that is often the reason why we get frustrated with our learners who are going much more slowly because they have to process through short-term memory and they have to take the test, we don't. So let's look at 
these principles apply to levels of learning, and I'll talk about novice, intermediate, and expert levels. So when you have novice learners, and that's essentially all medical students, um, they can acquire ideas, but they need to acquire them with limited information content. When we create our lectures or our group exercises, we necessarily are simplifying that content. Novices are trying to process a lot of variables. The combination of variables to them is a factorial, not simple addition like it is for us. Novices also do something that learners at higher stages may not do or may not realize they're doing, and that is use intuition. And novices are not too bad at doing that, and if they're willing to try, then they can um, be oftentimes very successful at, uh, at tackling new problems, but those problems still need to be fairly simple. Since novices tend to fail a lot when they're trying to learn things for the first time, they need a willingness to try and not be discouraged. And we as instructors need to encourage them and realize that this is a difficult process. When we get to intermediate levels, and this would be more advanced medical students, residents, and even people early in practice, uh, we can introduce more variables. Um, unfortunately, intermediate learners suffer from the problem that they have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. They get confused, and they are still working out the schemas into long-term memory. And those schemas take a while to construct. It takes lots of iterations of problem sets and exposure to cases in order to build them. Therefore, in intermediate learners, you have the phenomenon of very good to very bad performance going back and forth all the time. At worst, at times, they will perform worse than novices, and unfortunately, they are painfully aware of this. For that reason, what we need to do as faculty is make sure that we recognize that they feel insecure or don't feel good about failing, and we need to support and encourage them in the process. When we get to the expert level, we're using a lot of long-term memory, and I'm giving you the 10,000-hour rule here. To get expert in anything takes about 10,000 hours. And if you look at how long it takes to get into medical practice, that's about how long we spent in medical school and residency. Experts are able to combine lots of complex schemas and automatically use their long-term memory. They are what's called the unconscious competent. We are unconsciously using all of that information. And we reinforce that information by doing the same things over and over again. And we eventually begin to practice by pattern recognition. That is essentially how all of us get by in our clinical practices. We recognize patterns over and over again. Any of us who have looked at glass slides or gross pathology, that's exactly what we do. But since we do it so well, we tend to get frustrated with people who do not do that. And so we have to be aware that we can frustrate novice and intermediates, and they can become frustrated with us. Now, for 100 years, we had a model of medical education where the idea was 2 plus 2. We spent two, hours, two years learning basic sciences and then two years in clinical practice. And much of the two years of basic science was spent in lectures and learning facts. And then magically, when we got on the wards, we were able to use those. It doesn't work. Um, what we now try to do is what I would best call backward learning, where we learn in context of clinical problems and fill in the facts and use them in context in order to try to build those associations and schemas. The problem students have is that once they learn the case in one context, uh, generalizing it to others becomes very difficult. And you can get it up to 25%. And if you get multiple examples, you get it up to 50%. But it's going to take a long time in your career to go from 50 to 100%. And I don't think we ever really do it. So it does take multiple iterations in order to get the concepts well enough established be able to recognize variations of what we're trying to do. So with that background in learning theory, let's address 
the issue of our current generation of learners. It's often referred to as the net generation, um, people who are much younger than us, and they have been saturated by technology. And I've given you an example of just some of the things that have taken a lot of time um, during their years of growing up. Lots of hours in front of pixels on a screen. And if you haven't done that, or if you've done that, what else haven't you done? So, what are the characteristics of these kinds of learners? And I would tell you also that it isn't really generational. I can see these characteristics in just about everybody. And so, we all have various characteristics, but in the culture we have, in the technological world we have, um, there are probably more people who fall into the category I'm describing and have those characteristics. So, our current learners, do want some autonomy and they do want some control and they do tell us what they want. Um, but they do not always understand how, what they do or how they use their technology will affect their learning. Um, the good thing is that they do want more hands-on inquiry-based approaches and as we saw, doing things, kinesthetic approaches do have a better yield of long-term knowledge. But, we as faculty are often grounded in modes of educational delivery, which we have done for a long time, and if they've been good for a long time, well, then we should keep doing them. And so we now see a situation where students are simply not going to lectures anymore. That's a worldwide phenomenon. They do not use the traditional modes of educational delivery that we have had for a long time. What about their approach to learning? They like to have immediate access to anything. They expect immediate answers. Um, they do not like to delay gratification for anything, whether it's learning or in social life, inside the classroom or outside of it. Um, and they expect us to supply those answers that we give them. They may lack information literacy skills and often critical skill thinking skills have not been supported in prior education. Many educational schemes that got them into medical school required memorizing large amounts of facts and putting those down on the test the next day and then going on and doing something else. Uh, that's not how it works in medical school. If anything, there are two things different in medical school from undergraduate education. That would be it's an order of magnitude more information and you really do have to know the concepts and also you have to retain it. But our Net Gen learners have been bombarded for a long time with lots of different messages. Um, what do they tune out? What do they listen to? I'm not exactly sure I know. What about multitasking? Um, our current generation may not perceive exactly what the problem is. Um, we had a student last year who was an academic difficulty and we were talking about having a study plan and the student protested. I spent the whole afternoon yesterday in the library. And there just happened to be a staff member there at the time who was asked what the behavior pattern of the student was. And the student was there for the whole four hours. Of those four hours, how much of that time was concentrated, undistracted study? 20 minutes. Um, and so, having the motivation to develop a study plan and learning skills really is something our learners need desperately. We need to encourage them to use our educational materials in an appropriate fashion. Um, we often have students who rush through the things we give them. Um, I ask students, in, sometimes in due process, to read a case or part of a case, and they have difficulty even reading a single paragraph or getting through it. Um, it does take some practice in order to slow down and focus. And we often encourage learners to have immediate results or immediate participation, but as a result, uh, may not encourage them to dwell on a topic or um, search thoroughly do we really teach students to think on their own? 
And do we encourage them to communicate their ideas in a way others can understand? Um, one aspect of NetGen, uh, NetGen people is that they do appreciate peers and peer group members. So if we have a group learning process, they are likely to take advantage of that and recognize that as important to them. We have a group learning process here at this university that forms the bulk of our contact hours. But we encourage our students to study in groups outside of the regular hours and to make use of their peers. This helps them to um, take advantage of what other people have learned and it also helps keep them on track. The more links they have to other people, the more social connections and academic connections they have, the better off they are. Um, so the next gen learners are more comfortable with visual and audio, audio multimedia. They've grown up with that. So when we put things in visual and audio formats, they are com very comfortable using it. And as Dr. Talman has stated, once we do that, well, we've opened up a lot of hours to them for use. It's not just the lecture hall anymore. It's not just the laboratory anymore. Our current generation of students are more likely to look for information online. They have become very familiar with that environment. And um, the problem there, of course, is what is a good source of information? Are they good consumers of information? Our current learners like to be actively engaged. Well, that's a good thing because active learning is better than passive learning. However, the tasks they engage in are have more to do with looking up information and sharing information than actually reading or writing about it in a much more uh, cohesive manner. They like to be actively involved, but they also like to have involvement with questions and answers that arise during a task. We have to build in um, feedback that is as immediate as possible. They expect immediate responses and they expect responses that give them feedback about their achievement because they are achievement oriented. And they want a clear learning outcome. What is it I'm supposed to get out of this? As opposed to defining more global um, ideas about developing communication skills or professionalism skills and that sort of thing. Our learners are still focused mainly on the knowledge content rather than other domains of, of uh, achievement. Our learners are less likely to read through a chapter than to try to use hypermedia. They like construction rather than instruction. They often use a non-sequential approach which tends to frustrate us because we've designed an exercise or a lecture or a PowerPoint to go through from beginning to end and then we have our students jumping through it all over the place or we have a case that's presented and instead of going through it from beginning to end, they go to the end and then go to the back, go to the middle, go all over the place. Um, they do not like the one size fits all but tend to like personalized instruction to some extent, the group process does provide a bit of that, although if it's too open-ended, you've got a problem with getting uh, people to stay on task. Um, modern learners are more likely to rely on faculty to be facilitators rather than providers of information. How do I get to where I'm supposed to go? What are some of the problems that we face? Um, as I point out to my colleagues who would like to maintain the curriculum as is, I point out it cannot be maintained as is because the amount of knowledge content, biomedical knowledge, increases exponentially. The books keep getting bigger. The amount of information online keeps growing. You cannot say just go read a book. The books have gotten very dense. Learners cannot access all information instantly. They have to internalize some of it and they have to learn how to organize it and they have to learn how to use it appropriately. Hence, our learners need to become good consumers of information. And as I said before, is this really generational? I can find characteristics in all persons of all ages. Maybe some have more of them, maybe some have less of them. And I'm also fond of saying that no matter what we want to 
criticize our students for, I can find those same problems amongst any administrators, faculty, and staff only far worse. And that brings up the issue then of where are the role models? Uh, the students desperately need role models for uh, what they are trying to do and accomplish. And it's up to us to be able to uh, serve in that capacity. So that brings us to a discussion of information technologies. If we've gone through some of the characteristics of net gen learners, whatever their age, um, then what are some of the problems or issues or challenges in regard to information technologies? Well, we have students who come to us having spent a lot of time with electronic devices, and they may well have gotten very expert at some things. They're very good at email, they're very good at messaging, and they're very good at surfing. But does that necessarily guarantee that they're going to be good using the kinds of exercises or kinds of technologies that we have for them in the classroom? Um, the learner skills are quite heterogeneous, and so we can't just assume that because they've grown up in an information age or because they've used electronic devices to a great extent that they will be able to transfer that across to other kinds of tools or other kinds of processes. We also need to realize that the types of tools they use and how they use them will depend on their expectations of how they will learn. We have to communicate them to them what the importance of the exercises is. I spend a lot of my time explaining to people what they need to be doing, what's going to happen, what is happening and what happened. I need to provide much more feedback than I ever did before. I can't assume that everybody just knows exactly what it is we're supposed to be doing and why. I spend more of my time giving explanations. And this brings us to guidance. Um, our learners may be very bright and very motivated, but that doesn't mean that they can spontaneously identify exactly what they need. Um, I've had colleagues who took articles from the literature and posted them for the students to read. I used to have a colleague who would do that in the course and then put a question on the exam related to it, and then was always disappointed that the performance on the question wasn't as good as, as expected. And I said, well, did you really expect a novice student to be able to read an eight-page paper and pick out the phrase or sentence that you as an expert deemed important. It's just not going to happen. And so the idea is that some sort of guided instruction is necessary, whether that's in an electronic format, in a personal format, or in a traditional format. Um, the negative result of that is that we have students acquired misconceptions or incomplete or disorganized knowledge. Our students are motivated to learn, but if they're just learning disconnected facts or pieces of information that may not be the best ones, then they are becoming very confused. Educational research has really supported the concept of providing that direct, strong instructional guidance. If you want to call that spoon feeding or direction, then fine. But for novice intermediate learners, a lot of that, or at least some degree of that, is necessary in order to get past these first few stages. Yes, once you get into a subject and people have acquired a good bit of knowledge and you've gone through problems before, yes, then you can challenge them with more uh, complex problems. But at least to begin with, that's not going to work. So what? does our task become when we realize that learners need a lot of guidance? One of the biggest problems we now face is having to deal with that explosion of biomedical knowledge. And I don't think we can even agree on what the core knowledge is at every level of learning, novice, intermediate, and expert. We need to define the depth and breadth of learning and abstract that content to imaginable size and format it in a way that they can at least deal with it cognitively with active short-term memory. Um, if that is electronic, fine, but bear in mind that it's easy to put a lot of stuff in the box 
it doesn't look like the book anymore. You stack the books up and they look very big, but there's a heck of a lot more than that inside the box. And it needs to be in manageable chunks. And we need to promote the use of devices suitable to the task and stay on task, no multitasking, stay with attention span. So our learners need to become good consumers of information and they need to practice lifelong learning. That requires the motivation to begin the process. I tell students that they could be anywhere on earth in a medical school and the opportunity would essentially be the same and it would be up to you as a student to take advantage of that. Once you've done that, you learn to apply the information, but you must stay on task, whatever that process is. Our students must have time management skills and study skills to be able to get through that large amount of knowledge. What is metacognition? Understanding where you are, where you're at, and what you need to do. What do I know and what don't I know? What do I need to do to get the information to get me to the next step? So, for our learners, I often use the same analogy that doctors would use in practice. There's a treatment plan. We have a curriculum plan. And learners have to adhere to the plan just as patients adhere to the treatment plan. Um, the way we provide the curriculum or the treatments may change over time, but there still has to be a plan. And when we use electronic learning in the curriculum, those products and those processes will change, but they still have to be part of a learning plan. One of the things we've tried to emphasize in our curriculum is new learning methods. Learn, knowing that net gen learners like to use peers and they like collaboration, then let's build that into our instructional models. Those instructional models work well when they use medical models, that is patient cases, or even experimental based learning where we're talking about concepts from biomedical science. Either one will work, but they are cases. We want our students to participate in deep learning processes where they ask questions, they identify learning issues, they go to sources and select evidence, and they find ways to exploit information. They don't want just instant answers, but are willing to search out information and uh, integrate it together and find the answers. I'll give just two examples now, both case-based and team-based learning that help promote these skills and what are part of those processes that uh, support active learning. Case-based learning requires a small group, and for that reason, it's somewhat labor-intensive because traditionally you put a faculty member for each group. But the focus was to understand the case and the case was generally based upon a clinical scenario and you had some sort of clinical problem solving and you often put out common or very um, useful clinical presentations. You had to have some content knowledge but you were able to apply the content and it was a guided inquiry so that the cases were self-contained and, and, and you could finish them in a single sentence thus satisfying the uh, net gen order um, need for instant uh, success um, in, in their educational endeavors. And you apply the knowledge in the clinical context. And the learning objectives help guide the content. And as the groups studied the cases, the content was formulated in a way that all groups had consistent uh, deployment of that and you can give the same answers out to all the groups. One process that is becoming much more popular worldwide is called team-based learning, and I'll give you just the basics of it here. But from a resource standpoint in a school, it's very efficient because you can have one, two, or three faculty um, with a group of learners, and it's much less resource intensive than having a faculty for a single group of six to eight students. I've done team-based learning with as many as 130 students in the same group. The advantage is that you get 
the small group atmosphere of students working together with cases, but you also get the advantage of the teams reporting together and faculty feedback to all the groups simultaneously so that everybody leaves the group on the same page. Um, the cases can be written to be fairly challenging, and teams often engage in friendly competition. Um, you also drive this process by having a individual readiness assessment test at the beginning, making sure everybody has read the appropriate content to become prepared, and then you give a group readiness assessment test at the end where the students have to work together as a team in order to solve a very complex problem. They get a score for both with cumulative, and that's what tends to drive the process. And over time, the groups tend to perform very similarly, but they, they basically challenge each other to do the best they can. So that finally brings us to the last part here, which is how do we fit into the picture? What can pathology do for medical education? Well, there's some unique aspects to pathology as a discipline. We, of all specialties, are the one that bridges the biomedical sciences and clinical medicine. We do it all the time. We are the consultants for all the other persons on the healthcare team. We are well able to provide integrating learning activities to the student because, well, that's what we do. We also work in a visual world, and we're very good at providing visual medium. Pathologists are also very good at using technologies. We probably use more of them than any other part of medicine, and we can use that and blend our integrated skills to come up with learning resources that are technologically advanced, but also suited to the learners at the level they need to be, um, combining both biomedical knowledge and clinical science. Pathologists tend to focus on problem solving, and we tend to provide answers very quickly, and we can do a good job at it. So we're well suited to do this. Um, we have colleagues in biomedical science, and we have clinician specialists that provide specific skills, but someone has to oversee the process of putting the parts together. And when the curriculum is being put together, pathologists often have more to say or do in the process than anybody else. Um, we can guide our colleagues in trying to set the appropriate depth and breadth for the learning level. And as I like to say, we are the general contractors in building a curriculum. We may have uh, specialists or different parts of that curriculum, but someone has to oversee the whole curriculum to make sure it fits together. And somebody is building a half million dollar uh, half bath. What can pathologists do? We provide a lot of clinically relevant cases. Dr. Talman talked about the wealth of material that he had put together over the years, and we can blend that with biomedical knowledge. Uh, we also have most of the time dependent parts of medical practice, and we're very good at creating very efficient uh, time resource um, intensive exercises. We know how to provide our answers in a timely fashion. I should mention that assessment drives the curriculum. Never forget that. Um, how you assess learners determines how they approach learning. If you throw an exercise at the students and you never test on it, they quickly realize that they can easily avoid it. Um, high achieving learners are focused on high achievement. Never forget that. They want to do the best they can, and therefore we want to provide good quality tools. Um, I had arguments with many medical educators about what the focus of testing should be, but in the end it has to be mastery. We need to make sure that we define our objectives and content in a way that students can master it and achieve at a high level. Everybody feels much better about that, and we haven't left anything out. Obviously, when we perform on our own work environments in a hospital, credentialing demands 100% performance. We need to aim for that for our students. So, the goal is to facilitate learning. Um, it's not our job to impress everybody with what we know. As I said, the NetJet learners are more interested in our facilitating their knowledge and not just dumping data. Um, learning is not that easy for anybody short of an expert. We need to realize that a lot of repetition is necessary. 
And we also need to know that students don't just play with things, they have to use them to some end. There has to be a goal to the process. And in putting educational programs and educational processes together, just remember the more complicated the process, the less likely it will be used. The more grandiose the project, the less likely it is to be done. So when we talk about electronic learning, it's important for us to remember that what we want is critical thinking, and we want to provide an environment in which our learners can collaborate. They can access online sources, and they can get the answers. That can be done in those group processes I talked about. Faculty often become very um, insecure in those environments when you have cases that go beyond, say, your own medical knowledge or your own practice, um, particularly when we design exercises that have a lot of clinical focus to them. Um, early on, I had faculty who were a bit reticent, but as time went on, the fun of the process overwhelmed their reluctance to be in that setting. And I said, you can always use the two phrases I use when I don't know. That sounds like a learning issue to me. Let's come back next time after you've studied it. Or, I don't know. Let's see if we can find an answer. And that's part of the collaborative learning process. So, the more complex the electronic process, the less likely it will be completed. I suggest that everything we do be modular. Uh, we want imaging, but we don't want to overwhelm people with imaging. Um, novices just can't handle that much. Make it simple to use and easy to update. I've seen projects that were so grandiose they could never be updated and they simply gained inertia. And then we have to be cognizant of the level of the learner. Novices need very simple worked examples. You can create more variables and more complex problems for intermediates and then when you get to the expert level where we're at, the problems become very complex. So, an electronic learning exercise, make sure you debug it thoroughly. You have plenty of people around you. In terms of the informatics part of it, we have content experts. And of course, all the students. See what the usage is. Get feedback from them about how it is being used. If it isn't being used at all, then reconsider what it is you're going to do. So, thank you for your attention and um, I hope you gave some insight into something about learning theory and how it might affect the way we put together instructional systems and learning processes for students. And I will end with a view of where I live. I'll have some idea of what that looks like. Thank you very much.